As you see, we have uh, three talks tonight, and um, in my talk, I'm, I'm not going to focus on a particular topic, but I want to, or I hope to give you a few ideas where, um, yeah, what can go wrong in the Kubernetes cluster and uh, what maybe needs to be improved in your cluster. So I will try to shed light on a few issues uh, that I have seen in the past and uh, tell a little bit about them, and I hope you can take um, home a few ideas um, about uh, where security pitfalls uh, could be found in a Kubernetes cluster. So uh, Kubernetes today is pretty secure. Um, at least there are a lot of tools to <coughs> secure your cluster. That wasn't the case for a very long time. So before Kubernetes 1.6, there wasn't RBAC. Uh, before Kubernetes 1.10, there was no pod security policies. But um, I would claim um, today there's a lot of tools uh, to secure your cluster. It doesn't necessarily get easier to do it, but at least there, there are tools that you uh, can use. And um, also, um, <coughs> there's a general direction into, uh, to secure by default. That also hasn't been the case from the start. So uh, one example that uh, made a bit of rounds earlier this year was uh, the uh, insecure port uh, uh, um, on a kubelet by default. So it's possible to send a request and get information about the uh, pods that are running uh, to see environment variables that could contain sensitive data and so on. But uh, this is not the default anymore and in general we, I think, uh, go into a good direction. And the security track record um, also looks pretty good, I would uh, claim. Uh, so Kubernetes is a very big project. Um, it has a lot of code, a lot of contributors, um, a lot of uh, components and there wasn't really a security issue that uh, gave you, for example, a remote code execution on a Kubernetes cluster. So I think that's, uh, that really speaks for the, for the uh, project. Uh, um, but there have been a few issues and I think the most severe issue up until today was uh, the subpath uh, volume mount handling. So Kubernetes has a feature uh, when you have a volu volume mount in your pod, you can um, specify a subpath, and that basically says, um, don't give me the root of that volume, um, but uh, make the subpath inside this, that volume the, the root of my mount. Um, in a manifest file that um, uh, could look like this, and uh, the, the issue there was that um, when there was a symlink to some other resource on the host. So let's say you, you walk up the file system, the kubelet would, when setting up the pod, just blindly follow that symlink, and with that expose more data um, to the um, pod than actually uh, should be um, allowed. That was uh, before 1.10, so there were no, no pod security policies. Um, at that time, uh, so when, um, when a pod was running on, on your system, you really had to make sure if the pod should not see data on the file system, um, that the permissions on the files or directories are set appropriately. But in this case, that didn't work because the, the kubelet has more permissions than the pod it needs to have because it um, has to start pods. Um, so this was a good way to get access to data uh, where you uh, shouldn't have access. There have been a few other issues, but yeah, as I said, I think that was the, the, the most severe one. And um, in general, I would say things look uh, quite good uh, today. But um, what remains a problem is uh, complexity. And um, uh, this is a quote from uh, one of the former FreeBSD uh, security officers and he wrote that in a very different context when thinking about C software, but I think it, I think it applies uh, generally um, in the uh, software uh, world. And Kubernetes is definitely very complex and not only Kubernetes, but also the um, cloud environments that we work with today. So. 
Um, many of you probably use some kind of infrastructure provider. Uh, they have APIs as well. They have um, identity management and so on. So there's a lot of things uh, that you have to get right and um, that can uh, go wrong. Um, so in the, in the rest of the presentation, I will look at three problems. And actually, we thought it would be fun to, to set up a small uh, CTF. So if you have your computer with you or if you go home later tonight, you can go to this link and um, uh, try along the presentation to, um, uh, to uh, solve the challenge and to get access uh, to, the, to the flag. And yeah, for, for, for no, uh, you don't need to uh, like uh, start a lot of things. Um, um, you don't need to DDoS the, the cluster, so please don't do that so that everybody uh, can try. <clears throat> so the first thing that I want to talk about is um, the delegation of authentication. So um, you can configure your API server to um, expect a, a different entity in your setup to authenticate users. Um, and um, this is needed, for example, for API extensions. So let's say you have an extension that should uh, do certain things on behalf of a user. For example, um, deploy something into the cluster. This extension um, needs a way to act on behalf of the user. We uh, want to have that because um, the extension also should stay inside the boundaries of the user. So if you would just uh, have a cluster role binding to cluster admin for this extension, a less privileged user could effectively use this extension to elevate privileges and to, for example, deploy a pod that um, they would not be allowed to deploy otherwise. So for this, we have this um, configuration options for the Cube API server. Um, you can specify a certificate authority and um, every client that pre pre uh, presents a certificate that is signed by this authority is allowed to um, send authentication uh, data and to act on behalf of, of a user. <clears throat> so in real world, um, um, a systemd unit uh, could look like this. You have your um, API server, you have all your configuration options and then you specify the certificate authority and um, the group and user headers that um, then can be set to um, specify which group you want to act, um, uh, which group you want to use and which user. And the thing is there's a bit of a subtle problem with this uh, configuration and um, it's not obvious uh, from, the, from the very beginning. Um, the, the problem is that um, both the, the client certificate authority and the authentication, authenticating proxy certificate authority is the same. So in this line we say every user that presents a certificate that is signed um, by this certificate authority can act on behalf of a different user. And um, in this line, we see that this is the same certificate authority. So this certificate authority is for, used for all other requests. So when you gave a limited user to uh, some person, say a read-only user, because this person wants to do, run some monitoring software that fetches some data, uh, this is actually not only a certificate for this user, but also a certificate that is accepted as an authenticating proxy. So this person effectively can set those headers and with that, for example, uh, claim to be in group uh, system masters. Okay, the second thing I want to uh, talk about is pod security policies. Um, they have been added in uh, Kubernetes 1.10 and they allow you to define all different uh, kind of limitations um, for uh, workloads on your cluster. You can specify which user ID um, the uh, container can run as, which port they can bind to, 
and um, many other things. So uh, pod security policies would have been one way to actually mitigate this uh, CVE that we um, talked about before, um, but of course only with the right policies. And um, pod security policies um, also are kind of hard to get right, so it's a complex matter again, and uh, there is a, a potential to uh, make mistakes as with any other uh, software. So <clears throat> when we look at uh, this policy, for example, it doesn't look uh, very uh, dangerous at first. Um, we use port security policies, that's a good thing, and that's something many many users uh, don't do. We um, say that uh, the user cannot run as ID zero, so they cannot be root. Um, they cannot be privileged. Um, only volumes of type host path are allowed, and you can only mount a host path uh, from temp. So there's no sensitive data usually on a system in temp. And when there is data, it's often owned by root. So since we can't run as ID, user ID zero, we should not be able to delete <coughs> it, for example. So this looks safe at first. But there's also a big warning on the configuration page. And um, the warning says that um, you um, you, you need to make sure that all the paths that can be mounted need to be read-only. So it's not, not possible to, to have a host path that is read-write in a, in a secure manner. And we forgot to do that here. So even though we use pod security policies and we believe we have a fairly secure cluster, there's a way to access data on the host that we are not supposed to uh, to, to be able to access. And the third thing I want to uh, quickly talk about is um, server-side request forgery. Um, because I think that's often something that is not very obvious at first when you think about security. So often we think about direct actions of users when it's about security. What is a user allowed to do? where do I block a user, and um, so on. And the um, server-side request forgery is the idea that you somehow trick, uh, uh, for example, Kubernetes into making a request that then allows you to get access uh, to data or to make the software act um, differently or to, um, yeah, expose you something that then is the next step um, to, to exploit a cluster. And one uh, very nice example for that is um, a bug in the Shopify infrastructure. Um, it's really nice that they um, um, have this report openly on HackerOne. I recommend you all to, to read it because um, yeah, it's a very uh, detailed write-up what, what happened. And uh, the, the gist is that um, they, they have some feature. You can, you can create a store on Shopify, and you can uh, upload a bunch of uh, configuration files. And uh, yeah, in one of the files, you, you can also put some HTML. So somebody had the idea, um, why not uh, put the address of the Google metadata service there? So. Um, for those who don't know what a metadata service is, usually on infrastructure providers, you have an endpoint where you can get metadata when a node starts, for example, and uh, you can use this data to bootstrap your node or something like that. And this actually worked. So this person got back a screenshot, a preview of its, its shop, and there was a secret data in there from this metadata endpoint. So he was poking around for a while, and after a bit of uh, trial and error, he found a, um, a kubelet configuration file with a kubelet certificate and key. And from that on, he made his way up until, uh, to remote code execution and uh, full access of the cluster and so on. So it's a really fun read and um, often something that is overlooked when um, searching for security issues in a Kubernetes cluster.
And that's it from my side. If you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, take them. I don't know how much time is left, not much. Um, okay, otherwise I could also uh, demonstrate one of the uh, problems. Okay, then maybe I will do that. So, um, quick reminder. Um, We have configured our API server to allow authentication delegation, but we made a mistake. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we have no idea why it does that, why it didn't say that, but it'll, it'll come back. A little bit more, okay. Yeah, so I, I, I'm a normal user on this cluster. I have a, um, a cube config file, but I um, actually only have few permissions on the cluster, so um, I, I cannot start stuff. I, I cannot uh, read secrets. Um, where was that? Yeah, and what I want to do is I want really to get access uh, to this secret, but I'm, I'm not allowed to read it. But I, I have this idea in mind. Uh, maybe, um, maybe there's a, a problem with the request header setup. So I want to try that. And uh, um, to try that, I will first look at um, what uh, curl command um, I could use and um, kubectl has a very handy feature. When you um, raise the uh, verbosity level, you actually get the, where is it? Um, you actually get the curl command that is, um, that is an equivalent for this uh, kubectl command. So we can use that and um, what I do I, is I specify uh, two headers. It's X remote group and X remote user. As you can see, the, the, the group is uh, system masters because that by default in a default RBAC configuration <coughs> is, the, um, is the administrator group. And I only have to specify the user because otherwise the API server would not accept my, my request. Uh, so I specify the user that doesn't even exist. Uh, it doesn't matter. So we sent the request and actually we don't get back uh, 401 permission denied, but um, we get back data. So um, we can look at what it, this is and um, it looks like we actually got access to the data. Yeah, so if you want to try that yourself, you can go to this URL and um, I leave it running for a little while over the evening so you can also try a bit later if you want. Uh, the solution for this would be to use different steps, right? That's a good question. So the question was, what would be a solution for that? I would definitely recommend to do, use a different certificate authority for that. There's also an option to limit the allowed names but uh, my feeling is that um, this is not obvious because every time you get a certificate request, you, would do, uh, uh, you need to very carefully check what is the common name in this certificate. Uh, should I really approve it? So uh, I, I, I would guess, yeah, there's uh, people maybe just think, oh, that's my, my colleague. I, I trust him or her. Uh, let's quickly approve that. And, uh, if it's the, the, the right common name that is specified here, it would lead to the same result. So it should be a different certificate authority, yeah. yeah we actually have, like I say, you can say updated the Kubernetes documentation to actually express that. Mm -hmm. I did, but it's not reflected on the website right now because they have some kind of problem there. <laughs> so, yeah. It did emerge, so yeah. yeah. Cool. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, this is an issue as long as you have the, ah, sorry, um, the question was if you wouldn't use an identity provider as DEX, if that still would be an issue. And the question is, uh, yes, as long as you have the configuration mistake and as long as it's possible to send requests directly to the API server, it's, it's a problem. So it only wouldn't be a problem if there is an authentication API server and by some network configuration you make sure that all requests need to go through the authenticating front end. Yeah, I think time is up, so. Yeah, so if there is one more question, you can do that while Frederick is uh, setting up that. Yeah. But first, let's thank our speaker. Thanks a lot.